Minister Vivian Balakrishnan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Ukraine has been making headlines just about every day, and Singapore made headlines when it decided to impose sanctions on uh, Russia. Um, quite a rare decision on the part of a small nation like Singapore. What was, what was uh, the key reason behind the decision? The egregiousness of it all. The fact that it's such a dangerous precedent. The fact that it abrogates the norms of international law, the Charter of the United Nations, the fact that it's a big neighbour invading a smaller neighbour, uh, the fact that it tramples over the concept of territorial integrity, of sovereignty, of independence, even the allusion to historical mistakes and crazy decisions also rang alarm bells for us. Um, if you look at what happened at the Security Council, except for the fact that Russia vetoed it clearly in its own self-interest, otherwise that resolution would have passed with sanctions to follow. So when we looked at the situation, added it all up, we thought this is a time that you ha we have to take a stand, not because we're taking sides, but because these principles are existential for a tiny city-state. What's like different this time around, though? There have been wars before. This is the first time in about 40 years yes. that Singapore decided to impose those sanctions. Yes. What's different? Why was it so important for Singapore to make a stand now? Well, as I said just now, it's because it was so egregious. And it involved a permanent member of the Security Council. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. If you go back to 1978, the invasion of Cambodia. We took a stand, and in fact, we had to take a consistent, recurrent, annual set of resolutions in the United Nations, all the way from 79 to 1989, more than a decade. I'll give you another example. 1983, the United States invasion of Grenada. Mm. We voted against the United States, and I would quote Professor Tommy Cole, who was our permanent representative to the UN then, and he said there are times when our adherence to principles is more important than friendship. This is certainly one of those times. I think if you zoom the lens out, um, what we are witnessing now is the end of an era. Post Second World War, the concept of sovereign equality, the United Nations, trying to resolve disagreements peacefully, having the Security Council, economic integration, respect for boundaries, uh, was a formula for peace and prosperity for almost eight decades. Mm. Right? This is perhaps even a bigger moment than the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 because it puts a screeching full stop to that age. And now we are facing an uncertain bifurcation. This can escalate horribly. We are all looking at the abyss of stagflation. If, and it, the big if now, is what decisions and actions China takes. If you get a deepening of the bifurcation of the global economy, of supply chains, of technology, uh, this will be a very, very different world. And if you just look at it from an economic perspective, what a global bifurcation means, three things. Number one, progress will be slowed down. Mm. For the last eight decades, you know, let's take the science as an example. We were able to build on each other's advances, research and development, software, build a common stack. And that has seen rapid advances in technology. A bifurcated stack will not advance at the same pace. The second economic example is that if we all look for autarky, you know, either in source or friend source, you will have inflation because it will cost more because it will be less efficient. 
The third economic impact of a real hard bifurcation is reduced interdependence and therefore a greater propensity to allow quarrels to get out of hand. So sanctions are double-edged swords. This is not something you, know, you engage in trivially. And that's another reason why we have been so careful never to do that unless in most egregious circumstances. I'll pick up on bifurcation slightly later. People usually say your economic policy dictates your foreign policy. Would you have thought twice about imposing sanctions if that nation happens to be China, for instance? I mean, if you take a look at Russia, trade accounts for only 1% with Singapore. But if it's a country like China, trade accounts for 13%. So there is a lot more at stake. Would you think twice before making such a decision? Well, I would say foreign policy actually begins at home. So. First, what are your circumstances? What are your country's principles? Are your people united? And do you have the means, the capability, and the resolve to advance your interests? So it begins at home. The economy is certainly very important. And as I said, you know, sanctions are a double-edged mm. sword. And it leads to greater separation and ultimately to bifurcation if the two halves are far enough apart and viable separately. I don't want to get into hypothetical situations on, on China. Uh, to put things in perspective, the GDP of Russia is one-tenth that of China. And in terms of its trading relationship, certainly in, in, with respect to Southeast Asia, it's a tiny fraction mm. of China. So I don't want to get into that kind of hypothetical uh, question or situation. But I would also add from my experience interacting with China, China is also very aware of all this. Mm. And I think that's why if you look at or you listen to what China has said, they have doubled down on the importance of territorial integrity and sovereignty. So no question about their position on that. I can't help detecting some discomfort, some awkwardness on their part mm. with respect to this egregiousness of the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. Having said that, how do you expect China to respond? There have been reports I, suggesting that perhaps Russia is looking to China for assistance, perhaps even for weapons. I have no information on that, so I, I'm really not in a position to comment. But I am making the point that China does have important principles at stake to affirm and to live up to. I'm making the point that China has far more than even Russia in terms of its economic stake in an integrated, multilateral, rules-based world. And, uh, you know, but China will make its own decisions. And we, we, we will have to watch. I think the decisions over the next few days, next couple of weeks, are going to be absolutely crucial to this new world that is emerging ahead of us. And you, some people have said the most dangerous phase is when a new era is being born. The norms, the rules, the expectations have, are still in COVID. And that's when you can, you, the risk of misunderstandings, miscalculations are enormous. You talk about bifurcation, you talk about a new era. Are there echoes of a new Cold War? I mean, the last thing the region needs right now, Asia, Southeast Asia, the last thing the region needs right now are two blocks, one led by the U.S., the other by Russia and China. Is there a sense there are echoes well, of the Cold think War? If you put yourself in Europe, it's clear that Cold War has already started. In fact, you have a shooting war in part of Europe already. If your question is what is it that Asia is looking for, and particularly Southeast Asia and Singapore, that's not our interest at all. What we are looking forward to is that, look, Singapore and Southeast Asia have been key beneficiaries of this system for the last eight decades. Economic integration, free trade, flow of capital, investments, connectivity, mutual interdependence, and open and inclusive political and economic architecture. So if you ask any of my neighbours, what are you looking for? That's what we're interested in. 
We're interested in trade, we're interested in investments. We, interest, we are interested in keeping our region open to all the superpowers. We're not looking for one or the other or to play games. And the worst possible outcome is to be an arena for proxy wars and superpower contestations. We have no intention of taking sides and being a cat's paw or being a vessel state for one or the other. So we're watching. There are imp obviously what happens in Europe will have impact on Asia, but I'm signaling what Asia's preoccupations are. Given your concerns, the U.S. has come up to say, or rather there's some suggestions perhaps, that the U.S. is trying to build an Indo-Pacific NATO. What are your thoughts I, on that? Do, do, you, do you see the U.S. I, trying I, I to... I would dismiss that out of hand. Why? Look at it from a Southeast Asian or an ASEAN perspective. ASEAN is not a military alliance. That's the first point. The second point is that we're not looking for one or the other superpower to be a godfather to Southeast Asia. Not at all. So the arrangements, the reference to NATO, the reference to Europe, the reference to the post-Second World War aftermath, that's all irrelevant to us as far as what we are keen on. ASEAN is meant to be an open, inclusive association focused on trade, economic integration, inclusive and in expanding our bridges to all our partners, including the superpowers. And uh, we're not interested in military alliances and godfathers. So no, I would, I would dismiss that out of hand. There's been no consensus within ASEAN. In fact, you said in Parliament that ASEAN leaders stayed up till uh, the wee hours of the morning coming up yes. with a statement which did not even refer to Russia, neither did it refer to its stance? Uh, why was it so difficult for ASEAN to, well, come, I, I would, to come to consensus? Well, I would look first at what we did agree on. We all agreed on the importance of territorial integrity. We all agreed on sovereignty. And we all agreed that the situation in Ukraine was one of grave concern. We, in our second statement, we also asked for an immediate ceasefire. For the 10 of us, with such diverse perspectives, to be able to agree on these key bull points, I think was significant. Uh, I think we can, you know, we can quibble about whether Russia was named explicitly or not. But as far as I was concerned, the bottom line was territorial integrity, sovereignty. And getting so you're quite satisfied us. with the statement that was that was given about. I, I mean, frankly, the f I was pleasantly surprised we could even get that far. And I, I say this in all seriousness because again, you have to understand the diversity in ASEAN. Similarly, uh, the fact that only two ASEAN members abstained at the General Assembly, frankly, even that exceeded my expectations. Again, this is not a criticism of ASEAN. This is my realistic assessment of the diversity within ASEAN. So the fact that we've gotten so far, to me, is that very encouraging. It shows that we, are, we have consensus on what's really important, and we are able to express ourselves and take a stand. For the outside world, there was no consensus when it comes to ASEAN on its perception uh, to do with uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine. There's been a lack of progress in terms of the situation in Myanmar. Mm. Does it pose a challenge to ASEAN centrality? Will it erode ASEAN's relevance going forward, especially when it comes to geopolitical uh, challenges? My frank assessment is that we've actually done better than expected. Uh, and there are a couple of dimensions to your question. Let's deal with Myanmar. Mm. I think if we come back to first principles, if we agree on political independence, on territorial integrity and sovereignty, you will understand why we are so, in a sense, reserved or even constrained with respect to what's mm. happening within Myanmar. Meaning, we have to adhere to the principle that the ultimate outcome of the situation in Myanmar has to depend on the people of Myanmar. And external interference will only make things worse. 
And therefore, ASEAN's approach to Myanmar has been to work on the five-point consensus which our leaders agreed to. Um, and we are very disappointed there has been no progress, but nevertheless, we will keep pushing. And ultimately, we, the, the key elements of the five-point consensus stop the violence, especially against unarmed civilians. Number two, there needs to be honest to goodness mm. political dialogue between Dao Aung San Suu Kyi, the leader of the NLD, on one hand, with the military on the other hand. Everything else mm. is secondary. But, you know, you can, we can try our best to bring the two horses to the waters, whether they drink from the same water and they actually communicate is a very different order. But no. we must be patient and we must not try to take shortcuts which will in unwittingly make things worse. Uh, there's rising geopolitical tensions everywhere in the world. Yes. Do you think at some point this will lead to an arms race? We're already seeing the likes of Europe beefing up its um, defence spending. We're seeing Australia doing the same. Uh, Singapore spends about 3% of its GDP on defence, and I think there's been an increase of about 6% since the year before. Could we see an arms race in the region? Or the world, for that matter? I would take a step back and say that, uh, you know, what has been remarkable over the past few decades, I would say particularly over the last four decades, is what some commentators have called a peace dividend, meaning the prospects of a world war, the prospects of a major conflagration were actually so low. Many countries, and especially in Europe, could afford to spend less on defence. I think it was a mistake to assume that that is the norm. So what you're watching now, even if you watch the budget, say, of Germany, and I'm sure of the other European countries, is I think you're getting a reversion to the mean which means that every country needs to make sure, as we do in Singapore, that we have invested enough to be able to defend our own interests. What Ukraine illustrates categorically, nobody is going to shed blood for you. You have to stand up and be prepared to fight and defend what is yours and your way of life, and whatever it takes. And therefore, if you accept that this is a reversion to the mean, I do see increased expenditures on defence across the board, across the world, because we are going into a more dangerous world. But the point is to understand that last 40 years have been a unique and in fact a wonderful period of peace and prosperity. And our concern is please don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yes, we do know this, our world needs reform. You have to deal with inequality domestically, you have to deal with polarisation, you have to deal with the challenges of the digital revolution, mm. we have to deal with pandemics still ongoing, we, you know, and we have to deal with climate change. What do all these problems of the global commons require? It requires good sense, it requires sufficient consensus, it requires a multilateral rules-based world. It requires access to peaceful resolution of disputes. So that's the position that Singapore takes. You see. So coming back to your first question, why did we make this such an important stand and even underline it with unilateral sanctions? It's because we believe we are at an inflection point. And for what is worth, little Singapore is standing up for principles and expressing a hope for the rules of the engagement for this new era. Russia's attack on Ukraine prompted concerns that China could do the same to Taiwan. And China has come out to say that it is a completely different scenario. How, how are you assessing the risk of I, that? I agree with China that it's a completely different uh, set of circumstances. And uh, I, I don't think we should get into that kind of speculation and try to draw parallels from it. The more important point is this, that once you allow these principles to be abrogated, you make unilateral resort to violence more likely. 
and you create a more dangerous world. Coming back to sanctions again, I completely agree with the, the fact that sanctions are double-edged and that's why it's not something we engage in lightly. Um, but it's, for what it's worth, it's a symbol of how important this is and you have to make, hopefully, others in future who are thinking of unilateral resort to violence think twice. But that's a global, you know, like I said, the rules of engagement for a new era. Uh, Taiwan is a far more complicated question that you know, you'll, you'll need a far longer discussion <laughs> on this. Uh, I, I want to quickly touch on the uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework, yes. which yes. some say, perhaps you included, say that uh, it's been politicized, uh, something that can be used against China. Singapore is a tiny city state. Our trade is more than three times our GDP. So when we say we believe in free trade, it's not a debating point, it's lifeblood. When we say we actually look forward ultimately to a free trade area of the Asia Pacific, it may sound grandiose, it may sound impossible, but we actually do believe in it. What have we done so far? But is trade being politicized? No, but let me, let me, let me come to, to that, because you have to start with the end in mind, you see. If you know that's what we're after, what have we done so far? ASEAN succeeded in getting the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Ten of us plus five, unfortunately, India opted out. And that, frankly, primarily because of their concern with China. The other building block is the CPTPP. And that, again, it is, frankly, a strategic error on the part of the United States to have walked out of a skyscraper that it was a major architect for. Frankly, you know, I, every time I go to Washington, I continue to make this point that actually the best thing you could do would be to return to the TPP. Minister Vivian Balakrishnan, we thank you so much for your time today. Great thank insights. You. Thank you, sir. Take care.